morning from Washington, D.C. My name is Dr. Katherine Kelly. I am the Associate Dean and Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Welcome to all the alumni who are with us this morning uh, for this webinar on lessons learned from countering violent extremism in coastal West Africa. Let me extend a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us, all of our distinguished colleagues and friends who are online for this webinar. Now, for just a minute, um, let me um, review a, a bit about us at the Africa Center. Many of you are alumni, so you already know this uh, pretty well, I would imagine, but these webinars that we are offering online um, for on countering violent extremism, on other African security challenges, are informed by our organizational mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions to African security challenges. And this mission of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies is guided by our vision to advance security for all Africans championed by effective institutions that are accountable to their citizens. Uh, and we do this by um, the work that the academic affairs team does at the Africa Center. We also have a research and strategic communications team that is putting out the spotlights, the African security briefs, and other infographics that you may be able to see on our website. Um, they produce our daily media review as well um, that everyone can sign up for on the Africa Center website. And we also have an operations team that makes all of this happen and a community and alumni affairs team uh, that uh, maintains relationships with all of you, um, our very valued members of the Africa Center family. So um, thank you very much for coming today. We hope that your participation in these webinars will contribute to uh, the mission and vision that I've uh, underlined um, and will contribute to advancing security for all Africans uh, uh, across the continent. Now, let's move on to the topic of the day, lessons learned from countering violent extremism in coastal West Africa. Terrorism and violent extremism in coastal West Africa are on the rise but responses have not necessarily kept pace with this evolving threat. And so while governments have acted variously to try to confront the escalation of this trend, their responses also at times risk having a limited effect without sound strategic planning and increased familiarity with the applicability of some of the research and evidence-driven insights that are out there um, related to preventing and countering violent extremism and countering terrorism in Africa. So in a number of contexts, the disconnect between what sound research on violent extremism says, and then the focus of countering violent extremism and anti-terrorism programs has led to uh, less than ideally effective government interventions. As seen in other theaters in Africa and elsewhere where violent extremism is rampant, interventions that are not informed by inclusive, people-centered, context-specific, and robust policymaking tend to have had worse outcomes than those whose development is informed by a participatory process and broad multi-sectoral ownership of the strategies. The withdrawal of the French Operation Barkhane and the European Military Unit Task Force Takuba from Mali and their proposed shift of focus to the Gulf of Guinea countries also necessitates that West African coastal states and their international partners identify some of the shortcomings uh, uh, of the decade long counterterrorism approach and security arrangements that have been implemented in the Sahel to date. So the webinar we hope will help us all together explore how coastal countries and their international partners can integrate the lessons learned from the Sahel into their responses to the growing threat of violent extremism in the coastal West African region. We have two distinguished panelists. Um, if they could join me on camera now, that would be lovely, who will help us gain a better understanding of the actors, the structures, the institutions, and the processes that contribute to the growth of violent extremism in coastal West Africa. They will identify and discuss some of the strengths and weaknesses of the current government responses. And they will also attempt to help us draw some lessons 
from the decade-long counterterrorism approaches and security arrangements that have been implemented in the Sahel. So um, first we have with us Mathieu Pellegrin. He is a Sahel expert with the International Crisis Group, as well as an associate research fellow at the Sub-Saharan Africa Center of the Institut Francais des Relations Internationales, or IFRI. Previously, he was a special advisor in charge of intra-Islamic dialogue for the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. And he has been an international consultant for the World Bank, the EU, and a variety of non-governmental organizations. He was also editor-in-chief of the journal Sécurité et Stratégie, Security and Strategy, until 2018. And his research focuses on the Sahel, specifically Mauritania, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, he also looks at Lake Chad and Madagascar in his work. So welcome, Mathieu. We also have with us Samson or Sam Korkje. He is a senior researcher in the Institute for Security Studies Regional Office for West Africa, the Sahel and the Lake Chad Basin, and he's based in Dakar, Senegal. He joined the Institute for Security Studies in 2018 as a senior researcher based in Abuja, Nigeria. And before this, he has done a variety of work with uh, GIZ, uh, the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center in Accra, and he has worked in research positions at places like ECOWAS's Intergovernmental Action Group Against Money Laundering in West Africa and New York University. Um, so Sam and Mathieu, great to have you with us today. It's quite an honor. Um, and let's dive into the discussion. I think what I'll do is alternate between asking Mathieu and Sam different questions. And Mathieu, could we start with you? Alors, je crois que Mathieu va parler en français. Alors, I think Mathieu will speak in French. So I will ask you the question in French. Uh, what are the contagion factors? What are the drivers, the actors, the institutions that contribute to the growth of violent extremism in coastal West Africa? And if you could speak for about six to eight minutes, that would be great. Thank you very much. So the factors that allow these jihadist groups to grow uh, in this region, we, to understand this, we have to talk about what we have seen in the Sahel region, because we're talking about the same groups that are operating in central um, Sahel and the Lake Chad Basin, and they're moving south now. So the structures, the motivations, um, the, the the weaknesses they try to exploit are similar. So based on this, now a reality that has been observed and that is shared by a number of analysts in the Sahel area is that these, um, these factors for the recruitment and the growth of these groups are much less religious, but are rather more social. And they really, are based on um, feelings of injustice in certain situations. So there are four factors for the growth of these groups. If we look at uh, the past and current situation in the Sahel, first, there is governance and access of the access to resources. There's not a single space where these groups operate where the issue of access to resources has not been at the very heart of this um, growth of these groups. Now, the most important case, but it can't be the only one we focus on, but uh, it's the situation for the um, uh, pastoralist uh, populations that enter quite often into conflicts uh, I mean, we've heard a lot about it because there there are conflicts based on climate and resources uh, issues, and you know they they've been constrained in their access to certain spaces. So this causes conflicts. This is a, a really harmful situation because this feeds, uh, fuels the violence and poses uh, causes groups to exploit this situation. I'm not going to talk too much about the Sahel. We don't have um, enough time, but if there are questions, I'd be happy to. Now, this is 
also this is also applicable to the southern portions of all the countries in the gulf of guinea um, region in all this area the the conflicts that can um, arise from how this governance of pastoralists relating to pastoralist issues i, I can come back to specific aspects of this uh, later now if we talk about um you know farmer and uh, pastoralist uh, relations we must understand that uh, there can also be conflicts between uh, uh, other groups now for example access to gold mining areas um, are you know this involves uh, millions of individuals in the coastal areas and in the Sahel so for example in Côte d'Ivoire in Ghana uh, the, the challenge is to streamline or even formalize the exploitation of these gold resources and this can lead to result to situations where some sites are closed some populations are um, exempted from uh, sent out of these areas so this can really become a problem now in addition there are a lot of situations where there are local conflicts that have been exploited by jihadist groups in the center of mali in the mukti area and the segu area uh, this can this has been seen there have been open conflicts or some some conflicts that had been resolved for years uh, have been reawakened by one of the parties and the jihadist groups help them to uh, get justice from the other group. So if we draw lessons from these situations, there are situations in coastal countries uh, that, you know, could be subjected to this. Uh, you know, there are some conflicts that seem to have ended, you know, populations are at peace but there are still traces within uh, communities this is a case in Cote d'Ivoire and uh, you know these are ancient conflicts that can be exploited by these groups in Baoku in Ghana this is a situation that we you know we have to ask ourselves questions on this so this is the type of configuration with you know you have conflicts that have nothing to do with the jihadist groups that have nothing to do with the religious aspect of these groups but they exploit these situations thirdly it's the jihadization of banditry we see that these jihadist groups it try and stop other groups from having arms if it's that are not them uh, especially in the rural zones we need to we see the uh, rise of jihadism there is no area where we do not observe a double dynamic on the one hand bandits uh, criminals who are very uh, personally interested or they sh they share the same interests of the people in the area or others who join the jihadists and then others who refuse to and this is the situation that we can observe um, in the rest of the Sahel, the northwest of uh, in Nigeria, and also Kaduna and Sokoto also. And the last factor of expansion of these groups, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, we'll come back on it later, it's the uh, anti-terrorist responses so the third dimension i mentioned are structural dimensions what we note currently at least in the Sahel, i'm not speaking so much of the coastal countries but in the Sahel, um, there have been levels of violence that have been without precedence against civilians whether it's from uh, the army or others and this is one of the principal factors uh, for the expansion of jihadism and there are the four parameters so very quickly let's speak of the actors the dominant actor and the major one especially in the coastal countries of course it's uh jainim and al-qaeda the islamic state it was uh, jainim is the unique actor that still operates in togo ghana cote d'ivoire and even if in togo it's confirmed ghana it's still to be seen they're not very active there but in cote d'ivoire uh, 
there's substantial evidence of this for several months now. So uh, Jainim is definitely active in this area in Benin um, and other uh, areas that in the in the these are Jainim is also involved there in the parks and uh, most of the uh, uh, parks that's in the eastern part. Um, you have the presence also of the Islamic State who are, are taking credit for some of the operations that took place there. And if we go to the northeast of Nigeria, you have the uh, Islamic State and the side since 2018-2019 that has an operational presence. Um, they have, it's the junction between uh, these areas in the uh, border between Mali and Niger. And then in terms of uh, the Islamic State, you also have Sahu, you have in 2022, at the beginning of 22, uh, their presence. So these are the main actors and uh, very quickly. In what do we mean by structure? By structure, the oper that are operating today in the coastal countries are extremely fragile. They're fragile because they're recent and because for the moment they are still confronting uh, security and military forces that are rather robust in the, those areas. And so the this, this structure depends uh, very tightly with jihadist unit, units or cells that already operate. So for example, in Burkina and the other countries that where they already are well ensconced. Uh, in Niger, it's a bit different. All this to say, I won't go into detail right now, but all of this to say that the capabilities of these jihadist groups, uh, they're quite rooted and anchored in these countries. And uh, their ability to consolidate their presence in the coastal countries is to be seen. If there might be some sort of rupture between uh, the, uh, if there can be a rupture or interruption between the cells on the coastal countries and the other countries, that uh, is what, what we can seek. So more the groups are consolidated in the Sahel, more they are likely to expand into the coastal countries. Thank you. Thank you, Mathieu. Yes, it's a key to highlight the interdependence of what is taking place in the Sahel in terms of the structures and organizations and dynamics of these uh, groups, uh, what has already taken place, what is taking place, in uh, to determine what will take place in the coastal countries. It is very interesting also to hear within the factors that you mentioned, the access to resources and also the links between the illicit and uh, legal economies that also play an important role in the governance of, uh, of these areas. So we will surely come back to this today during the questions and answers. Thank you. Let me now turn to Sam. Sam, can we build on what we began discussing with Matthew? Could you talk a bit more about recruitment in coastal West Africa? So what would you say are the risks and vulnerabilities to recruitment in coastal states? How are violent extremist groups exploiting vulnerabilities, um, including in uh, responding to needs of communities for security, for access to justice, for basic services? Um, if you could take us a step further, um, from uh, the, the the contagion factors that Mathieu discussed in about, uh, I don't know, eight eight or nine minutes, that would be great. Right. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, I think that uh, it's very critical that we reflect on the, the question of recruitment uh, for the simple reason that it's at the very core of the resilience and sustainability of um, extremist groups. Uh, irrespective of the uh, of the size, and I think in discussing amongst uh, others the drivers of violent extremism, Matthew has already touched on uh, some of the key issues that comes to the fore uh, in terms of what enables um, violent extremist groups to really have the the supply of human resources that um, uh, that they need, whether by way of active involvement or uh, simply by association. Uh, 
Um, I think uh, I would like to touch a little bit on how recruitment may be manifesting before I get to the risks and the vulner vulnerabilities. Um, obviously, we don't have enough data um, uh, that will give us clarity uh, in terms of how recruitment um, uh, may, be, may be happening. Uh, but I think that there are a few pointers that we can look at. Um, if you take a look at um, the April 2019 uh, arrest uh, in Burkina of uh, Omaru Jallo, uh, who happened to be the leader of um, a local uh, jihadist group. Now in his possession uh, was a list of contacts uh, in Ghana, in Benin, in Togo. And obviously, I mean, this suggests uh, possibly that there uh, may be placement of cells, uh, small cells within these countries that may, amongst others, be undertaking uh, recruitment drives. Now, about five years before this, uh, back in 2014, um, there had been reports of reconnaissance uh, being conducted uh, by extremist elements um, in places that, that are very close to the uh, Penjari National Park uh, in Benin. Now, all of this, I think, goes to confirm uh, what um, one of the key uh, members of the Den Mujao, uh, who later became the, the leader of ISDS, uh, what he had expressed. And that was a strategic vision to recruit uh, West Africans into, into uh, terrorist, uh, terrorist groups. Now, at the same time, however, um, if you look at Ghana's uh, recent arrest, uh, of an Islamic cleric uh, and 30 of its, uh, of its uh, students uh, in the northern part of the country uh, on suspicion of being linked to terrorist groups. The, 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 there's an indication that individuals within coastal states may be developing uh, extremist views as a result of uh, having been taught or having been uh, exposed to um, some narratives by people within. So you, you, you don't necessarily have um, externals coming in to, to, to recruit um, individuals. Now, in terms of profile, um, I think the, the example of a university student uh, in Ghana leaving the country to join uh, ISIS, um, I mean, it, it's, it could, possibly mean that they are, they are young and educated uh, males uh, who may be leaving to join or who may be recruited. Uh, but I mean, whilst we try to understand um, the way recruitment may be manifesting, uh, I think it's also important to look at the vulnerabilities uh, that may offer um, a ground um, for, for, for recruitment. And here I'd like to highlight a few issues um, first is that the disconnect uh, between the state and populations um, is quite uh, uh, strong in, in, in coastal states, especially in the northern parts, uh, the border areas. And I mean, these, this, kind, this kind of a challenge um, uh, existed or exists in the Sahel, and we've seen it exploited by, by uh, extremist groups. Now, in terms of the disconnect, um, you see that uh, basically the state is not able to provide basic public services, uh, basic infrastructure, or even protection of um, uh, not just people, but also their, 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 their livelihoods. Now, to the extent that um, populations or people feel that they are not connected to the state or they are abandoned by the state, then obviously there would be a quest for alternative, um, uh, irrespective of whether or not it's palatable. And that is where we see um, many of these group, uh, groups stepping in to perform the functions of, 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 of the state. Uh, there was an example in, in the Mopti area back in 20, 
2018 thereabout, where uh, a gentleman had, um, you know, complained uh, of bandits uh, attacking uh, his village and stealing livestock, and there were attempts to reach out to the to state agents um, and even traditional authorities uh, to come to their aid in terms of protection, but they, never, they they were basically on their own, and so the the alternative was to join um, uh, groups uh, as as a means of uh, protecting uh, themselves. Now the other point that I would like to make uh, in relation to the vulnerabilities is the kind of um, natural resource governance that we've seen, um, not just in the Sahel, but also in recently in coastal states. I think that um, some of the policies um, that have been implemented in terms of restricting populations from accessing certain areas either for hunting or either for um, mining in, 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 in gold rich areas. I think that poses um, a lot of risks uh, because in, in parts of the Sahel, um, namely in the Liptako Guruma uh, region, uh, groups have basically come in and allowed uh, communities to, to hunt. They, they've allowed communities to do gold mining. Um, and they, they basically told them that, look, these, this is your resource, this is your God-given resource, you have the right to exploit them to your benefit, and nobody has the right to uh, restrict them. And by so doing, they do endear themselves to communities and, and get a lot of support and in the process also uh, recruit um, uh, a lot of people. Now, the, the other vulnerability that I think coastal states also need to look out for is what kind of relationship um, exists between security forces and populations. Um, and here, uh, there are a number of issues. First is the level of trust um, in the capacity of security forces to protect civilians um, against violent extremist groups. Um, and also the second is the, the kind of treatment that civilians receive, um, especially when operations are being conducted. Uh, and we've, we've seen cases of human rights violations um, and, and what, when that happens, um, the extent to which civilians can even get justice um, uh, becomes a problem because even the justice institutions either don't exist or they don't have the capacity to deliver the kind of justice that, uh, that is uh, needed. So the, the, the very uh, problematic relationship between security forces and populations also um, has the potential to feed into, into uh, recruitment. The final point that I would like to make, and, and, and then I'll stop, is the, the many, many local conflicts um, that exist um, in northern coastal states and local conflicts, not just in terms of, um, you know, between populations and the state, um, when it comes to access to resources, like I just talked about, but also within communities uh, and between communities. And here I'm referring to the, the many farmer herder conflicts or simply, uh, intra-community conflicts uh, that often has to do with uh, who becomes the tra uh, traditional leader, who becomes the chief and, and, and whatnot. Uh, I mean, the tendency has been to brush aside any possibility of external influences uh, because um, the, the, the argument is that these are purely the results of local dynamics. But uh, what we've seen in the Sahel, uh, especially in the Leptako Guruma region, is where groups have tended to be very strategic and very pra pragmatic uh, in terms of posing as either arbiters or simply taking sides in these conflicts and, and by so doing, uh, winning um, a lot of support in, in some of the communities. So let me stop here. Um, obviously, there are a lot of um, vulnerabilities that we can talk about. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you so much, Sam, for giving us um, uh, four top line vulnerabilities uh, that coastal states um, could um, look out for. And um, I think what you say sort of underscores, um, again, natural resource governance comes into play as a key element, relationships between citizens and the security forces, but also more broadly, the state comes into play. And, um, you know, of great interest, I think, is dispute resolution, grievances, and access to justice really are, are sort of at the fore of how some of these responses, I think, um, could be strengthened. So thank you for underscoring that. Um, okay, so let me go back to Mathieu. Mathieu, uh, nous allons continuer. Uh, so we're going to continue our conversation. I'm going to ask this question. How do you violent extremist actors in coastal West Africa, um, how do they mobilize financial resources? And what is the role of women in uh, these groups' economic endeavors? Can you take about seven, eight minutes to tell us what you think? Thank you, Catherine. So I will reiterate uh, what I already said, is that the presence of the jihadist groups in coastal uh, countries is now in an embryonic stage, meaning that these groups are not established in a permanent manner in these countries. They, there's a lot of back and forth between Sahelian countries and these coastal countries. And, and they really strongly depend on this uh, for their financial resources at this point. Now, traditionally, the financing method for Sahel groups, this really relies on collecting the zakat, uh, which is associated with, you know, the clandestine sale of animals to uh, coastal countries in many cases, and also uh, the uh, gold, uh, the co mining gold has been a, a big resource. And this means that it can be used for bartering and that's a big part of their financing. And even if it's not monetized, uh, there is also there's the ambushes against uh, army groups or and others. This is the biggest source of equipment <clears throat> for them. So if we look at these three types of financing, the coastal countries at this point don't have the means to be, you know, they're not autonomous within these countries. They haven't had they haven't carried out enough um, attacks in these countries. And then, for example, in Cote d'Ivoire, the gold mining areas, um, you know, even though there have been uh, issues in the past, they're not yet fully established. Now, the collection of the Zakat, um, the uh, W National Park, you know, there, there's, uh, it's quite developed, but beyond the park, it's not very developed. So for the moment, these groups are relying and they depend on their Sahelian forces. So if we look at Kefolo, uh, the attacks that took place in Kefolo in Côte d'Ivoire, systematically, all these groups were coming from Burkina Faso. Same for the north of Benin, uh, when there was an attack there. Most groups are operating to the east of Burkina Faso, and this is truly a, a jihadist center. And, um, and there were you know, quick incursions that were made, and then they go back to Burkina Faso. Now, once financial autonomy is set up, and the border areas that have gold uh, resources can become a midterm source of financing. And this, it's already the case, I think, in a sort of a clandestine manner. Uh, if you look at the East or Burkina Faso, there are mines that are completely under their control at this point. And the Torodis area in, in Niger, uh, or a bit to the north. <clears throat> and then and there have been some significant attacks in Cote d'Ivoire and Benin. Uh, that means that they, and even in Togo, that they have been able to obtain some military equipment through these attacks. So this, you know, this sort of autonomy, they're, they're working on it, they're, but they're not yet there. The financial resources are currently really obtained from the units that are based in the Sahel. 
Now, secondly, uh, when we talk about the economies of these groups in coastal countries, an important point is that these there is <clears throat> a trafficking uh, a lot of uh, traffic is coming from Benin, from, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, trafficking of fuel, uh, motorbikes, fertilizers. Donc, so all of these, you know, uh, there are actors from West African countries that are involved, but this doesn't mean that they are part of these jihadist groups. They, they essentially, it's a trading relationship they've established with these groups because there's a financial exchange. So these trafficking groups are not necessarily financing these groups in, in a direct manner. If, if I talk about uh, Islamic State in the Greater Sahara, uh, they, they really um, source their motorcycles from Nigeria. And one of the financing methods is bartering. Uh, they send arms towards Sokoto State and they barter these weapons against uh, motorcycles or spare parts. So these are the types of relationships that exist. It doesn't mean that these groups belong to the jihadist groups. I mean, some are, you know, walking along the path to radicalization, but others, for others, it's really just a trading relationship. Now, the role of women. Now, for in the Western countries, it's everything is much too recent to have a clear picture of how women are involved. But what we see is a sort of a worrisome change. Uh, traditionally, uh, there have been, ISS has um, had several publications that talk about the role of women, the, the role of women since 2012 in jihadist groups, with the exception of Boko Haram. Well, with Boko Haram, there has been a lot of kidnappings, but women, um, in other groups can play logistics roles. They can uh, collect information, they can cook, but it's basically secondary functions. Um, in the center north region in Burkina Faso, a woman was arrested two years ago and it was seen that she had, she sold a lot of cooked food for jihadist units. There are a lot of cases like this, but what we've been seeing for the past year and a half, two years, it's really a radicalization of the role of women. And when I say radicalization, I mean that they are no longer limited to secondary logistics functions. It seems now they're on the battlefield. They are fighters. Uh, so this is, you know, this has been at times verified or sometimes it's just rumors. So we can, cannot say it definitively, but in Burkina Faso, I've heard of two cases where women were directly involved in fighting. And what I glean from this information is that there is this social radicalization that is taking place where your, you know, for example, your spouse has been executed or there have been abuses uh, during anti-terrorism operations. The, the only thing you want to do at that point is take up arms yourself. So there was also frustration from arising from ancient incidences of injustice in Burkina Faso, in the Seno province. Women have been associated to combat. And it, now, in fact, what we've seen is that these women came from gold mining areas uh, from which they were expelled 10 years later. And they're now coming back to these areas and attacking civilian population. So there's a really, there's a real social radicalization of women as well as men. And so now you can see that some women are taking up arms. Thank you so much, Mathieu, for this analysis of gender in this field. And thank you for um, emphasizing the fact that, that we can see several types of, of links between uh, violent extremist groups and those who are the criminal actors in the area or those who take part in illicit economic activities. They're not necessarily the same actors, but 
often they, they just uh, they operate within the same territories or they're li they have links to communities, which mean that uh, that these activities can take root. So now let me turn back to Sam. Sam, could you spend seven or eight minutes now walking us through um, following, building on our questions about financing? We know that illicit proliferation and circulation of arms and weapons uh, feed into existing trafficking networks, and that can contribute to fueling violent extremism in Africa. So do we know from where and how VE actors are getting their weapons? Um, and if you have any examples from the coastal states in particular, that would be helpful. Um, and I'll ask you maybe eight, eight minutes or so so that we stay on track for um, our Q&A time. Let me also remind folks that while you're listening to Sam and Mathieu, if you have questions, please type them in the chat and we'll start collecting them for um, uh, Q&A discussion. Sam, over to you. Thanks very much again. Um, I think that um, to better understand where um, violent extremist groups uh, may be getting their weapons from, um, it's important to look at uh, some of the major political and security developments um, in the last 10 years, uh, not only within West Africa, but also um, in, in North Africa, especially in the case of Libya. Uh, of course, there's a lot of history, uh, but I think that one of the major turning points um, was the fall of the Gaddafi regime and the, and the civil wars that followed um, the years after. Um, so there are two main sources that I would like to highlight here. First is that with the, with the fall of the Gaddafi regime in 2011 uh, came the loss of control of Libya's uh, massive uh, stockpiles, which it had uh, amassed over a period of about 40, 40 years. And so traffickers really had a field day uh, in accessing these stockpiles and taking them and, and smuggling them through a chain of networks, um, through the border um, with Niger and, and, and Algeria, uh, especially through the roads that ran through Agadez um, uh, to armed groups uh, in the region, uh, specifically in Northern Mali and eventually in the Lake Chad Basin, where, of course, uh, Boko Haram is, is, is active. Now, this obviously was uh, big business um, as the rebellion in northern Mali was um, subsequently in full swing and, and, and there was substantial need for, for arms in those years. Um, there were other trafficking routes uh, that went through northwestern Niger, um, down south uh, to Difa and, and, and Zinda regions and further to um, northeastern Nigeria. Uh, now, from 2013 to 2014, thereabouts, um, these flows from Libya uh, down to the Sahel had slowed down uh, for two principal reasons. First is the, the outbreak of the civil wars in, in Libya, which then led to an increase in demand um, for weapons within the country uh, by different um, armed factions. And then the second is that Mali and Niger had really strengthened their uh, military presence um, along their common borders, um, including with Algeria. And actually they had made some uh, interceptions of, of arms and weapons. But really the, the slowdown did not last. And in fact, in the last 18 to 24 months, uh, we've seen a surge in, in the trafficking business uh, with weapons, not only going to civilians in, in, in northern Mali and northern Niger um, for purposes of self-defense, uh, because these, these civilians are very frustrated by the, by the lack of protection uh, by the state, which I referred to earlier. Um, but aside from that, it's also going to uh, various uh, armed groups in the region. Um, now, in, in terms of how this is trafficked, um, I mean, there are several methods, uh, including uh, hiding them uh, in trucks uh, amongst uh, goods uh, that are crossing uh, borders in the region. But I think more importantly, uh, what the reduced 
influx of um, weapons from Libya did was to force armed groups to become more daring and to look for other, other sources of weapons. Um, and this really has led to a strategy of them targeting stockpiles um, uh, within military barracks uh, and other security uh, installations in the region. And, and, and usually they do this by arriving um, at, at, at barracks in very large contingents, uh, either on motorbikes or in, in pickup trucks. And then they tend to overwhelm soldiers um, who often are caught off guard and cannot <laughs> match the, the, the kind of weaponry that uh, these groups have. And so when the defenses of these barracks um, are destroyed um, and the soldiers are overwhelmed, then it enables groups to basically seize the weapons and the uh, ammunition that uh, they have. Uh, now, there has been several reports of this um, in, in, in the Lake Chad Basin, for example, we've seen uh, Boko Haram attacking and overrunning uh, barracks, especially in north, northeastern Nigeria and making, making way with uh, so, many, so many weapons. This has also happened in the Lechako Goma uh, region. Um, and in fact, uh, ISGS has posted videos in which they do display uh, some of the arms or the weapons that they, they have looted from, from these attacks. Um, so, but I think that they are, there's another aspect that we need to pay attention to. And, and this has to do with the potential for groups to also tap into locally manufactured uh, arms. Um, and in, in, in some instances, I think most likely they have, um, but largely these kinds of arms have fed into local conflicts, um, whether it's farmer herder conflicts or inter-community conflicts um, and, and things like that. But I think the potential is there for them to also um, uh, tap into that. Hmm. And, and, and not just that, finally, um, the, the possibility of also uh, procuring explosive making materials. Um, and uh, an example of that is the, is the kind of smuggling of fertilizer that we've seen uh, from Ghana to Burkina to other neighboring countries. And all, we all know, of course, that fertilizer is, 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 uh, is one of the ingredients for making IEDs. And so whereas there's no direct linkage between the smuggling of fertilizer and um, uh, the kinds of attacks that we've seen, I think the more they become available, uh, the greater the likelihood that uh, groups could possibly uh, lay their hands on them and, and, and use them to their benefits. Mm -hmm. So let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, again, thanks for tracing us through um, a variety of different sources for how the arms, um, we may find um, arms being trafficked or produced locally. Um, and I think um, this plays into a broader conversation, it seems that we're having about um, how um, different, uh, different uh, flows uh, of goods uh, uh, and um, different natural resource uh, availabilities are, are playing into some of these broader dynamics that we see um, in violent extremism across the region. Uh, I think we want to do one more round of questions with Mathieu and Sam, and then we'll go into the Q&A. So let's turn to lessons learned um, from responses um, in coastal West Africa and, and more broadly. Um, I'll turn to Mathieu first. So Mathieu, what are the uh, weaknesses and strengths of the government responses in the coastal countries in Africa um, facing this growth of ex violent extremism? Thank you. I will start by saying that, first of all, the coastal countries have a uh, laboratory that they which is the SIA where they can they can see what has worked what has not worked so the experiments uh, they can look at there uh, so they can really learn from what worked what did not work in the SIA so they were able to uh, really stem uh, approach the threat fairly early to have preventative um, 
um, responses in place, and this has had results. So it's a mix of community responses, security, strictly security apparatus responses, and this has enabled the stabilization of this area. For example, in the in Benin, the Beninois, uh, uh, the the Department of Borders in Benin uh, that was created in 2012, Benin already in 2012 was aware of these inequalities, uh, territorial inequalities between the North and the South. And the idea was to create to create between the state and the populations uh, a community approach to to have a basic uh, social services to those who needed it this of course was fairly costly but there's also the this was um, coupled with a security approach to better protect the borders. So this kind of uh, resumes uh, so to have a social development, economic development from the state, and then also a security military approach from the state to reinforce uh, governance of the territory. Cote d'Ivoire has also followed the same idea, a more recent, uh, more recent with their more recent program. Um, that will take place until 2024. Very subtly, they mix uh, infrastructure, social services, basic services with intelligence services, uh, civilian military um, um, work together. And so this, um, and working with the communities. And if we look in the context of Cote d'Ivoire, this has led to, to great results. Uh, they have not had attacks, and this really has, at least for the moment, uh, kept the situation safe. In terms of Cote d'Ivoire, there is also very clever usage of the uh, Dozo hunters. Everybody, they're very strong in Cote d'Ivoire. They, uh, they know they have the experience of the civil war. Uh, or part of the conflict of that time. And the Dozo uh, really have helped to secure the territories of Cote d'Ivoire. So this mix, this combination of community actions, military security, has really allowed to sort of buffer the uh, danger for now. Uh, more generally speaking, this does not mean that all the responses have been taken into account or or that they are perfectly adapted to the changing situation. There have been, unfortunately, a new every time a new phenomena, phenomena arrives uh, for the presence of jihadism, of banditry, and we knew it wasn't uh, Ivorians or Beninois, they were foreigners. There is also a sort of gap between the reality of the phenomena and the time that it takes to develop uh, awareness of it and then a response to it. Similarly, once the jihadist reality was confirmed, there is the temptation to uh, see that people, that there's only a religious channel to all of this. Um, there, there are papers that have been written, and we have noted that there are collaborators that uh, from the, for example, Quranic school. So there is a misreading, nevertheless, of the situation, which have sometimes led to preventive measures that are not quite tailored to the situation, to the reality. So if there is a problem that uh, with religion, the factor that determines the uh, whether somebody uh, becomes a member of a group or not is not always religious. And so there is the question we always come back to of social justice, uh, having the basic structures in place, infrastructure, uh, consolidate the 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 the, the buy-in of citizens and although if we don't have that then we cannot prevent the th uh, stop the threat and this remains uh, a challenge for all the countries on the coast as well as the sahel we come back to 
to the question of the lack of access to resources as well as to justice. So there's the economic politics policies that are often structurally uh, unfavorable to parts of the population. And this really, really undermines any efforts of the government. If you do not rectify and rebalance the relationships between herders and, and, and farmers and uh, reinforce social justice, really you're not going to solve the problem. So with along with that reality, what we have seen in the Sahel and in all of the coastal countries as well, a wave of stigmatization as well that sometimes is expressed uh, by the Fulani, qualifying Fulani populations as this or that, pastoralists. There is a stigmatization of these communities and it's extremely, extremely terrible because it, it, it really feeds into uh, local conflicts, community conflicts, or, and uh, uh, several individuals can take this concept and really, really um, uh, turn, make the, make recruiting to jihadism uh, more attractive to some. So this is very toxic. We saw it in the Sahel. Uh, and for the moment, even if the cases of violence are very limited, even there are some in Vena, that's a very complicated situation. Niger uh, will as well. But another risk is the presence of the Dozo. I mentioned the Dozo hunters who for Cote d'Ivoire, they're a source of uh, intelligence and information gathering and prevention. But we've also see in the Sahel context and in the Northwest of Nigeria and Sakai, how these groups, uh, auto self-defense groups can, and can become a problem and even the main problem. So one has to be extremely aware to, to make sure that these uh, groups are not be, do not become the main ingredient of a, a bigger problem. And so to end, this is stigmatization of pastoralists, herder communities, uh, the problem of uh, land rights, land justice, uh, so, because and then the the policies from one country to another can change or different, but also these uh, oftentimes we do not allow herders to have access to water, and this really is a terrible source of conflict. If we take the case of Togo in July of the attacks that took place, you have to keep in mind that these attacks were perpetuated only because the animals had been stolen and by the uh, Togo, the authorities, the state of Togo. And um, and all of, and so that was the source of that problem. So there is this issue of social justice and it is tightly connected to these pastoralist groups. So, you know, the states are sovereign. It is, uh, that is a fact. But this doesn't mean that sedentarization must take the form of stopping herders from moving about. Yes, mobility is a very important topic within this context, of course. Now, you also spoke in the beginning of your answer. Uh, you talked about the Benin Agency for the Integrated Management of Borders. And we can say that here at ACSS, we we had a webinar. Uh, we had a, a webinar that we held with Marcel Baglo participating, who he is the director of this agency. And so that's uh, what this agency uh, has been doing, as you said, they've been doing good work since 2012. So I'm going to turn to Sam now to close the session. Sam, um, before we go into the Q&A, um, could you spend uh, seven or eight minutes talking to us now about what lessons more generally we can draw from the decade long uh, set of counterterrorism approaches um, and security arrangements that have been implemented in the Sahel? As we've seen throughout the webinar, what's happened in the Sahel um, affects what's happening in coastal West Africa. Mathieu has taken us through what some of the coastal states are doing to respond. Could you very briefly um, give us some parting um, ideas about lessons we can draw from, from the Sahel? Right. 
So uh, I think that uh, when we look at the situation in the Sahel um, over the last 10 years um, and what it is today, I mean, it's clear that um, it's in a much worse shape, um, despite the level of investments that we've seen in terms of money, in terms of uh, boots on the ground, uh, even equipment, and more, more importantly, the, 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 the number of lives that have been sacrificed. I mean, it's, it's not commensurate with the kind of results that we've seen. Um, so there are quite a number of lessons here that I would like to highlight. First, I think has to do with the need for contextual analysis. And of course, as a researcher, <laughs> this coming from a researcher, somebody might say that, well, uh, he's, he's just trying to ask for more, for, for more work to do. But uh, I think that um, it's important that um, strategies are anchored on strong contextual analysis in terms of the logics of engagement in violent extremism, why, why do individuals join? Uh, and in some cases, why do they refuse to join? Uh, what are the circumstances that, that lead them to join? And I think in doing so, uh, it will enable decision makers to really identify some of the structural um, drivers of the problem and, and, and sort of put them in a position where they can, uh, in a very coordinated, in a very sequenced manner, uh, address uh, these drivers, be it governance or be it developmental. Uh, because what we've seen, for instance, is that groups have tended to infiltrate and implant themselves in communities where the social contract between the state and populations are very weak. Um, what it has to do with providing security, like we, we talked about previously. Um, we have also seen that groups uh, have tended to exploit local conflicts. So, so the, the need for a comprehensive contextual analysis uh, is important. The second lesson that I like to highlight has to do with the kind of uh, military operations or counterterrorism operations that are conducted. I think the focus should not necessarily be on trying to degrade groups, although that's important, but it should rather be on protecting civilians, on protecting civilians. Um, and to the extent that uh, civilians feel exposed and feel that they cannot get protection from the state, I mean, they are going to look for alternative. Um, the third lesson is um, the, it has to do with the issue of dialogue. Now, we know that groups tend to have foot soldiers, they tend to have middle managers, and they, they tend to have commanders. And in most cases, their interests don't align. Um, People may have joined for purely economic reasons or ideological reasons. There may be all kinds of reasons why they have joined. And it's, 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 it's important to segment the membership uh, of groups and try to see which ones can be dialogued with and which ones are not, are not um, are the, are the non-negotiables, so to speak. And, and I think the starting point for that could be those who have defected or those who have been arrested from these groups and the kind of information that is elicited uh, from them. And I think already um, the, in the Lake Chad Basin, we, we, I mean, there could be examples of that. I mean, we've seen Nigeria, Cameroon, Niger, Chad um, try to implement um, DDR programs that um, sort of amongst its objectives is to incentivize defection. And so to the extent that defection happens or people just, um, people get arrested or they just leave voluntarily, uh, there can be, um, you know, a sort of an engagement that gives, that gives um, important pointers uh, as to who could be talked to and who could not. I think the, the issue of dialogue is very important. Uh, 
Now, the, the final uh, lesson that I like to highlight has to do with external support. Um, I think we can all agree that, of course, external support is very important in terms of uh, financial support, technical assistance, or even sharing of experience. But what we've seen in the Sahel is that um, this kind of support often comes with very long delays. And there are often many, many constraints. Um, they are linked to different kinds of, uh, of interest and agendas. And that tends to complicate um, the whole counterterrorism um, uh, effort. And to put it more bluntly, I think um, it was such that countries in the Sahel did not really manage to exercise the, the kind of political leadership that they needed to, they needed to have um, on counterterrorism. And I think that lesson has already been taken on board um, in, 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 in the context of the Accra Initiative, where um, littoral countries um, plus Burkina have really gotten together uh, to try to address terrorism vulnerabilities that are specific to them and, and not really wait on any other external uh, sort of uh, support to be able to do that. So um, let me stop here and I'm sure there are, there are questions that we can deal with later. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sam, for those parting thoughts. Um, thank you to Mathieu as well. Um, so I think what we'll do now is move into our question and answer session. I've been looking throughout um, our conversation at what sorts of questions are coming in from those who are typing into the chat. Um, we see more and more coming in. So we'll try to address as many as we can in the 20 minutes we have left. Um, before I do so, let me just remind the audience as well in terms of resources we can offer through this webinar. There's the um, web page for the webinar where we have Mathieu's and Sam's own research on some of the issues they talked about. Um, so those are accessible there. We also have um, some Africa Center analysis of some of the themes that came up today on um, countering violent extremism, um, what's going on in the Sahel, and a recent piece, a recent piece on pastoralism, as well as um, some of the, the dynamics we're seeing in coastal states. So um, my team is going to share on the chat in the different languages of this webinar um, ways to um, click on links to get to all of those different resources. So now let's turn to questions. I think what I'd like to try to do, um, Sam and Mathieu, if it's not an impossible ask, I'll pose three or four questions in a group. Um, maybe um, we can split up those questions. And if each of you can speak for five minutes, we can fit in two rounds. Um, so I know that's hard given the vast nature of the topic, but let's try to do that. So um, for the first round, um, we have uh, a couple of questions. One that came in quite early was about um, early warning systems. So thinking of policy responses um, or different approaches to dealing with some of these dynamics we've talked about, um, do either of you know about any successes or challenges um, with early warning systems, um, particularly um, in relation to preventing or countering um, violent extremism in the regions we're talking about. So um, what do you think of uh, early warning mechanisms? Are they a helpful tool? If not, um, are there things that the regional institutions like ECOWAS, for example, could do to make those um, more effective um, in dealing with some of these issues? So that's question one. Um, question two um, is uh, coming from our Francophone audience um, and it's particularly about um, the dozos um, and um, in, in the dozos in Cote d'Ivoire that uh, Mathieu, you mentioned. So maybe Mathieu, you could take this as um, your second question um, and I'll read it in French. Uh, the actions of the dozos uh, who essentially form a bulk work against terrorists in Cote d'Ivoire are, are not overestimated. What weapons? do the dozos have. They also are present in other border, bordering <clears throat> countries. So what are they doing in these bordering countries or other, you know, for the dozos and other self-defense groups? What are the advantages uh, in involving these groups in our responses? And then, finally, let me put a third question into the mix here, um, perhaps for Sam. So each of you could answer early warning. Matu, you could talk about the dozos. Sam, 
Um, we have a couple of questions about um, PCVE and the ACRA initiative. So um, people were saying, you know, we've discussed a lot about counterterrorism responses, the weaknesses and the strengths of those. Um, how is the ACRA initiative helping um, uh, concretely um, in the domain of um, not only CT, but PCVE? Could you comment a bit more on that initiative, give our audience a sense of it and, and where it has gone so far and where it could go? So um, let me first turn maybe to um, Mathieu. And if you could try to keep um, your response to five minutes, we'll be able to do another round after we go to Sam. I'm going to limit myself to five minutes. Thank you. So early warning systems. The issue, if we're talking about the Sahel region, the problem is that you have a lot of different early warning systems uh, that are side by side, but they are not coordinated. Uh, so you have one app, uh, which is uh, ECOWAS system, and then at the national level, you have different early warning systems that coexist. So this is clearly it, it, these are not adapted to the situation and they're not efficient. If you look at Niger, which is the country where the early warning system is the most functional, you know, it is linked to the decision making process because that's not the case elsewhere. It is operating within the uh, Ministry of the Interior and so they've set up this early warning system, which means that information can quickly uh, be uh, brought upwards towards decision making authorities. And, you know, the information is not stuck in, in, a, in an email account or on you know, piece of paper on an office. It is directly and quickly uh, taken into account by the authorities who uh, decide, you know, to use it to um, appease a situation. So we must get rid of duplication and these systems must be linked to decisional entities and that are not, you know, rather than secondary um, uh, entities that really have nothing to do with the decision-making process. Now, the dozos, I, I think this is a very interesting question and this uh, brings me to the broader question of self-defense groups. Now in Côte d'Ivoire, for the dozos, all the configurations I am aware of, the dozos or other self-defense groups, when they are given task of gathering uh, information, etc., they are essential to the security of the, the territory. The only limitation is when you have self-defense groups who only come from one community or maybe two communities, and they're not inclusive, you can have, they can essentially decide to denounce other groups to the authorities. But when they are used for defensive functions or gathering intelligence, then it is not harmful. Like Côte d'Ivoire shows, with the exception of the Cafolo region, uh, where the groups cooperated outside of these regions, these self-defense groups were you know, could form a, a prevention, they could provide information. So they're an essential item. But if the situation uh, is in degradation, gets worse in a country, that can be more complicated. They, they're they not trained for that. Their uh, community links, of course, uh, the very often to land conflicts. Uh, we saw that in Burkina Faso. We saw this in the states in the northwest of Nigeria, and we could see it in other countries in the future. So we absolutely need to limit their involvement in insurrections, but uh, keep their involvement at the intelligence gathering and sharing level. Thank you so much, Mathieu. Great, let's go to Sam. Um, so Sam, if you could also limit yourself to five minutes, we'll be totally ready for a second round of questions. Right, yes, uh, I think on early warning, um, I think there has been enough early warning. Uh, there's um, an elaborate system for doing that. The, the real question is early action. 
um, how do we translate early warning into early action? And I think that's where the challenge is. Um, I mean, from where I sit, I cannot really point to any success stories um, in terms of early warning leading to early action on counterterrorism. I mean, I know that, of course, um, oftentimes, coastal countries uh, have had their neighbors warn them about um, extremist elements who may have slipped um, into their territories. Um, but as to whether or not that necessarily led to them repelling specific attacks, I think is yet to be seen. Um, so there's not a whole lot um, of successes uh, when it comes to um, early warning and 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 its its impact on early action. I think on the Accra initiative, uh, first of all, the Accra initiative I think is a reflection of, um, and I'll be very blunt on this, on a lack of confidence in in ECOWAS. Um, now you see that ECOWAS has uh, a counterterrorism strategy. Um, back in 2013, it did have a, a counterterrorism strategy. Um, but then you see that the pace at which ECOWAS moves and the bureaucracy and the time that it takes for it to respond to certain situations is what I think motivated uh, Accra Initiative member countries to, to get themselves together and put this arrangement, um, which focuses on intelligence sharing, training, um, and also preventing, um, uh, preventing violent extremist attacks, as well as uh, organized crime. Now, if you look at the objective that was set in terms of attacks prevention and what has happened recently, um, obviously they have not been 100% successful uh, because attacks have spread quite uh, rapidly, uh, either in Northern Benin or in Northern Cote d'Ivoire, and more recently in, 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 um, in Togo. I think there are some advantages of the Accra Initiative in a sense that it's, it doesn't have the huge administrative structure that the G5 had, uh, which was one of the challenges. Um, the fact that countries are more willing um, to share information, to share intelligence amongst themselves. Of course, there are challenges uh, when it comes to language barriers, um, Ghana being the, the only Anglophone uh, member country of the Accra Initiative. Sometimes there are difficulties in terms of communication. Um, there are also difficulties in terms of the differences in, in security systems. In the Francophone countries, you do have the gendarmerie, whereas in Ghana, you don't. And so who gets to do what? Um, and how do you define the concept of operations, even in joint operations? Uh, sometimes it's a challenge. So uh, there are um, opportunities, there are strengths, uh, but there are also challenges uh, when it comes to the Accra Initiative. Um, that's what I can say about that. Great. Thank you, Sam. Um, je vais changer pour parler en français. I'm now going to speak in French again. We have, we have from our audience, um, those who are with us, we have a, a, an alum from the Africa Center, and I'm going to read their comments. And then we will continue with the second round of questions. So she said, all of the national mechanisms of early warning system are placed under the authority of the prime minister or the vice president of the member states to facilitate a holistic management for the protection of uh, the human rights and to implement what we have called ECO-1, which is the ECOWAS early warning system. She also says that the problem is at the level of the responses because the accent is not placed on human security, and that should be the priority if we want to 
lessen the issue of insecurity. So that is one of the comments with in terms of early warning systems. So um, building on what it is that we've started discussing in the first round, let me pose a couple of other questions for a second round before we close the webinar. And I think we're seeing a, a couple of different um, ways of asking a similar question. Um, what can be done on a regional level? Um, given that what's happening in the Sahel, what's happened in Libya with arms flows plays into what we may see now in uh, coastal West African states, what kinds of responses across countries um, make sense? And so there are two questions about that. I'll read them to you too, and you can um, respond as you wish. One is, what can you advise governments of the West African or Sahel region to do to curb terrorism? Um, what can other states do when governments help armed groups? Can they use responsibility to protect, for example? Um, or are there other responses to that question that you might have? Uh, nous, avons, nous avons eu uh, une question qui est assez similaire. We have another question that is rather similar from one of our audience members, participants. A few years ago, in the responses in the fight against terrorism in the Sahel, we saw uh, the J5 uh, take place. Today, with the extension of terrorism towards the um, coastal states that are uh, the same GITs groups, what can we do to prevent their extension and their expansion? So uh, do we need a response uh, similar to the J5 or do we need an even larger response? That is the question. So I think those are the main questions. I know there was also a question posed to Mathieu on Burkina Faso and Mali and some of the influences on what we're seeing in the coastal West African states. Um, so, Mathieu, you can feel free to address that as well, maybe as part of your response. This time, let's start with Sam. Sam, if you could do five minutes again, and then Mathieu, five, and, and we'll be just at time. Yes, indeed. So, what can be done? I think that um, we've already had some pointers from the lessons learned, um, as well as the vulnerabilities that we highlighted. Um, the first point that I'd like to make is that there are no quick fixes to, the, to this problem. Um, you cannot, and uh, that has been often a tendency of uh, some, some partners to basically ask, okay, so what can we do in the next six months or the next one year? Um, when you're, what you're dealing with is deep-seated developmental governance challenges which are going to take a long time to address. Um, the issue that has to do with the relevance of the state, um, not just the state even being present in specific communities, but to what extent are they relevant? Is the state relevant in terms of protection, in terms of delivering access to justice, in terms of all the other basic services that communities need? And to the extent that that's not provided and this, this, this kind of void is left, is left there's, going to be, there's going to be a quest for an alternative. I mean, that's, that's only natural. And that's why we are seeing some of these groups step in to perform the functions of the state uh, in some cases. And it's very similar to organized crime groups and drug traffickers um, who would go into communities with a lot of money, uh, do a lot of developmental works, and, and in the end, you know, generate a lot of support. So in terms of what can be done, I think the, the, the looking at the structural drivers is one of them. The second point has to do with uh, the need to share experiences um, amongst countries. The need to gather together um, from time to time to share experiences, to identify what has worked, what hasn't worked, um, best practices, what can be replicated where. Um, I think that's, that's very, very important. Also strengthening um, intelligence capabilities, um, being able to see what's going on. I mean, it's, it's also very important. So, I mean, there's a whole host of things that can be done. Sure. Um, some are more structural, some are more immediate, um, but I think that we can reflect on these issues going forward, yeah. Great, 
Thank you, Sam. Mathieu, over to you. Oui, merci. Sur, Thank sur you. Le... On the last question on what can be done, what must be done, I would say I, I'm not pretend, I'm not suggesting I have the all the answer all answer, but I think you need to find a good balance between uh, uh, military and security responses, protection, civilian pr protection of the civilians because they're the first victims of conflicts, and and if they're victims today, they might be jihadis tomorrow. So they must be protected. Dialogue, social cohesion between the communities, among communities, and dialogue even with armed groups, as Sam was saying earlier, because there are different types of dialogue that can lead to demobilization, etc. And I think that the, the bringing together these three elements will allow to have a balanced response that is efficient as well. And for now, no state has succeeded, maybe Niger, but we're still quite fragile. So in terms of the question on Burkina and Mali, what were the consequences of the expansion of violent extremism in these countries? Well, of course, there are many, many consequences. But as I was saying, first off, the expansion leads to uh, an even stronger anti-terrorist response. But this makes more. This leads to more and more civilian victims. And in, I've always said that uh, you can never. Um, this is not a solution because uh, using fear to keep populations from becoming members of these groups does not work because relatives of victims are going to go to the other groups to get uh, to, to fight back against to get revenge. The second consequence that is very important is that up until now, the jihadist violences were in the rural areas and of course, uh, the state capitals weren't too concerned with it because uh, it didn't concern them so much. But, but with this last uh, Malian crisis, we see this is no longer the case. So in, instability in a country will lead to instability, political instability. So for example, Burkina Faso, because the last two coup d'etat of January and September were perpetuated um, and created tensions within the armies and led to a coup d'etat. So, you know, with the increasing deterioration, uh, you know, this means that the the future of the regime is, is compromised and increasingly so. Secondly, how does this uh, expansion uh, violent extremism manifest itself. Now, in, in the Sahel, there's this, uh, the, 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 the jihadist movement is really taking root. You know, there are areas that are under the dominance of these groups and they're uh, providing justice, they're applying Sharia law, and, you know, there are incentives for the populations, but they're also contrasts. So the perception of this governance is very uh, fluid and changes depending on the context. Now, secondly, the this anchoring within the rural areas is expanding uh, to really the outskirts of urban areas. So you have blockades that are set up by these groups. They stop populations from leaving the cities. They stop uh, armed forces from uh, supplying themselves. So this can lead to uh, dramatic situations like in Burkina Faso, you had provision convoys that were attacked recently, or you have uh, local um, agreements of the jihadist groups with local communities that are set up. So there's really this anchoring of their governance within certain areas. And they're really the ones who decide the agenda of regarding the future of secondary cities in these countries. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mathieu, for taking on uh, those questions. Thank you, Sam, um, for your further reflections on these big questions as well. I know we could uh, spend all day talking about this and still have more to unpack with one another. But um, 
Thanks to everybody who joined us today for this discussion. As Sam underscored, um, there's a need to share more country experiences, contextualize experiences, lessons learned, um, emerging good practices. And so we hope to be a part of what the broader community will continue to do on that um, uh, as we move forward. And thank you once again to both of our experts for sharing their time and their knowledge with us today. We hope everyone in the audience, um, alums and otherwise, will join us again as we continue um, all along the path of having further discussions about these issues and others that relate to African security in the future.